No, it wasn't hard because I didn't know anything better. I mean, sure, other kids had fathers, but I never met other kids' fathers, I don't think. Uh, at least I took them for granted. And my mother trained me to be self-sufficient. There go the transatlantic voyages and back. And, and then that one winter, 34, 35, when I went to school, boarding school in Switzerland. I mean, she just said, here's your suitcase, get the train to Fribourg, and off you go. So here again, I'll take my passport and chug, chug, chug across the border to Switzerland. And, uh, and uh, in the summertime, I got this passport, or this Nansen passport, as it's known, in February of 1929. That year, it was used to go to a trip to Denmark. Uh, my mother had a client of hers at Elizabeth Arden, who was a very wealthy woman and had a big estate about uh, 40 kilometers north of Copenhagen. Uh, and uh, she invited my mother to come and my mother told him the problem of I was there anchoring her. She said, well, why don't you send him up? I've got children you that age and he can play with our children and then you come on up later. So the question was, how do we get this seven years old to Denmark by himself? Well, these people had a friend who was an Italian army officer who was going, happened to be going from Paris to that same, to visit them in Denmark. So they said, oh, uh, Pepe from Italy will be glad to take your son with him. So Pepe reluctantly agreed to take me on the train, and that was a two-night ride. The first leg of the journey was from Paris to Cologne, Köln, which is daytime. And then we transferred train in Kern to a sleeper type train to go to the north eastern part of Germany. While in Kern, we had a layover about an hour. So this uh, Italian lieutenant uh, decided, says, come on, Greg, let's go and let's go to the bar. So he looked at me and says, have you had beer before? I says, no, never had beer before. He says, well, now's a good time to start. So first thing I knew, we, I was slugging away some good German beer, and that was my introduction to alcohol at the age of seven. And, uh, and that guy was smart because I slept through the night without bothering him. <laughs> and... Uh, so then uh, we got to the uh, destination. We again changed trains, and then it was already a sort of like a Danish train, went on a ferry boat, and they actually put the train on a ferry boat to an island. We, then we chugged across the island to another ferry boat, which ended up in Copenhagen. And that was the end of the run. We were met, and I spent a very lovely summer with these folks and their children. We went to visit uh, my grandmother's cousin uh, at, at the uh, eastern part of France, in, uh, near in the Alsace-Lorraine area, and her her cousin's husband was then working on the Maginot Line. He was an engineer working, construction engineer, and he was involved in all day long. He was involved in digging the Maginot, Maginot Line to defend France against the potential invasion of Germany, by Germany. So I always remember that connection with the war, <laughs> that the uselessness of that type of a fortification. <laughs> and I think that is the year that my grandfather passed away. 
uh, and things were a little bit rough at home. So she was glad to be able to farm me out for the summer, and I went to visit my aunt. And by that time, uh, she and her husband, uh, they didn't have a child yet. But they rented a cottage uh, not too far from London, one of these big estates that had cottages that rented out, and there was a estate owner and took care of things. And um, anyway, it was a very pleasant and wooded area. There were other children I could play with. The only dramatic thing that happened there was in this cottage, you know, in those days, plumbing was rather basic. And I found out that when you flushed the toilet, that you could look out the window and see the stuff run out in the gutter. And for a 12-year-old kid, that was very fascinating. Uh, but to see it better, you had to kind of jump on the toilet as you flushed it. So I, I did that once too many times, and it cracked the toilet. And boy, did I get spanked for that. And my aunt's husband, he was just furious. Well, what would you do that for, you know? And try to explain the silly notion of watching your toilet flush go out the window <laughs> was just unbelievable to him. He said, what do you want to do that for? <laughs> so anyway, uh, but I did also meet the owner of the estate. He was a very nice gentleman. And the rest of the summer passed by nicely. And four. And out of a clear blue, we got this invitation from my father to come and visit him. He, by the way, he had come to see us in 1927. So there, there was some correspondence with my mother and him all this time. And then in 1934, Rhodes says, why doesn't Greg come over to the United States for the summer? Come to Westbury, Long Island. And my mother says, would you like to go? I said, yeah, why not? Deals were done, I got my visas and, and tickets on the Bering area. My mother took me to uh, Cherbourg, and put me on board the Bering area with a tugboat going out there, and the tugboat brought her back, and uh, left me with the purser, and said, would you please take care of this young man? And he said, yes. And as I remember, they gave me a terrible cabin. It was hot and noisy and everything. And they say, oh, that kid won't mind. Well, that kid did mind. And I went back to the purser and said, hey, I can't sleep in this thing. It's too hot, too noisy. Why don't you have something else? And eventually they gave me a very nice double bed cabin. I said, well, I don't need two beds. He said, well, enjoy it. <laughs> And uh, uh, so, and that I showed you the photograph of my having fun with these two ladies. They assigned you a table, and it just so happened these two American ladies were at the table. And by then I did speak some English, uh, having been to England two or three times. And uh, they were from Philadelphia. And this all became our surrogate mother across. They made sure that I didn't get into trouble any place. But uh, so did the crew of the ship. And uh, gee, they took me all over the place. I mean, when the engine room and up to the deck and the, uh, just showed everything. There were other children on board that I could play with. I mean children of other passengers. And the other passenger says, where's your mother and father? He says, well, I'm alone here. What? <laughs> so you can say at the age of 12, across the Atlantic unaccompanied, and uh, nobody looking after me. And, uh, uh, no, I think I had greater 
sense of independence. At least I was more sure of myself. <clears throat> when, when you lived on this apartment in, in Boulogne, uh, right on the main street, just within two or three blocks, there was a dairy store, a butcher shop, a vegetable shop. So many times as I grew older, I mean, from the age of six, seven, that sent me down the street to pick up this and pick up that. And uh, uh, I would go. And I always remember for milk, I used to bring my own liter bottle. And you'd go to the, this dairy store where they have cheeses and stuff. And the milk was in a stainless steel tub with a ladle hanging on the side. And you took the bottle and you took the ladle and you filled up your own bottle with the milk. I mean, very sanitary. On the butcher's shop, the meat was hanging loose outside. And uh, vegetables, of course, everything's outside. Uh, but I didn't get sick. I survived all that stuff. Built up a lot of antibodies. Afterwards, in my uh, working life from 1946 till basically 1988, I traveled internationally all around the world, and I never got sick. I, and I, and I, I ate what they put in front of me. And if the natives eat it, I eat it. <laughs>